the report I'm going to bring you today, jaw-dropping development in relation to what you see on your screen from the Supreme Court of the United States. Certiary granted January 5th of 2024, also known as the U.S. Supreme Court decision on a Trump Colorado ballot case. And many calling it monumental, rightfully so. And not just for the 2024 presidential election, but that's what we will be focusing on today. Many expecting a quick ruling. However, thus far, the Supreme Court has remained silent on the Trump immunity and Colorado ballot cases. Oral arguments were held in the Colorado case on February 8th with a ruling expected quickly on whether Trump is ineligible because of his role leading up to the January 6th attack of the Capitol, Section 3 of the Constitution's 14th Amendment bars people from office if they engaged in insurrection, that term. And who qualifies is what is being contested, but again, not fully what the story is about today. No, the Atlantic slipped something out. Near the end of the Supreme Court's oral arguments about whether Colorado could exclude former President Donald Trump from its ballots as an insurrectionist, the attorney representing voters from the state offered a warning to the justices one evoking the January 6th riot that had set the case in motion. By this point in the hearing, the justices had made clear that they didn't like the idea of allowing a single state to kick Trump out of the presidential race. And they didn't appear comfortable with the court doing so either. Sensing that Trump would likely stay on the ballot, the attorney Jason Murray said this. If the Supreme Court didn't resolve the question of Trump's eligibility, it could come back with a vengeance after the election when Congress meets once again to count and certify the votes of the Electoral College. Do you know what that statement means? Do you know the magnitude of that statement? Do you know the implications of that statement? All of which we're going to cover here in just a moment. I want to welcome all of you back to the broadcast. My name is Justice Knight. I work with Lisa Haven, as many of you know, part of Restricted Republic, the platform we created for you to give you all the news, uncensored, unfiltered. Do me a favor before you go to RestrictedRepublic.com. I need you to make sure you're subscribed to Lisa. And then above, she's going to put a link for you to subscribe to me. So no matter where we broadcast on the public platforms, you could find us. But if you want everything we do, no matter where it's at, you want to support us and you like the way we're, we're bringing in a message and you like the message we're bringing, I need you to go to RestrictedRepublic.com today. Take a break from the video, jump over there, subscribe. And to do that, I'm going to give you two discount codes. I'll put them both in the description box below. Very special discount codes. RR39, $39 a year, an annual fee. For three years, not one, not two, but three years plus 14 days for free. Or RR4, $4 a month. That's right, $4 a month for three years. Not one, not two, but three years plus 14 days for free. That offer is being put out there for a very good reason. And trust me, you're going to want to subscribe now because when it happens, you won't hear this anymore. There is no other time to act than now. RestrictedRepublic.com. Get there today. Lisa's hoping for as many of you as possible. I can't tell you how much that means to her. But now, let's get back to this broadcast. How many of you remember this picture? I know you do. The January 6th committee meeting on Donald J. Trump and the events of January 6th, of course, also become a somewhat misleading shorthand for something bigger. A months-long campaign by Mr. Trump and his allies to subvert American democracy and cling to power by reversing an election. That was the claim and what was being reviewed as part of the January 6th hearings. Those were followed by a strong-armed attempt to subvert the Electoral College process and bludgeon Mr. Pence into taking part, all leading to the violent effort to keep Congress from formally affirming Mr. Trump's loss on January 6th. That is the centerpiece claim of the January 6th committee. The Democrats have stood firm on this. They've called for any measure possible to make sure it didn't happen again and doesn't happen again. 
Why aren't we calling the Capitol attack an act of treason, the Guardian stated. Newsweek, nearly 80% of Americans think Trump should face penalty if convicted. Taking that even further, Business Insider. Rasmussen poll, one in five Democrats want Donald Trump permanently imprisoned, exiled, or executed if convicted over election fraud claims. These are very serious measures. But the Democrats, the majority, have stood very resolute in their belief of the penalty for the events that occurred on January 6th. But now something different happens. Something extremely jaw-dropping. And by the way, I want to let you know, stay tuned to the very end of the video. Lisa and I have prepared you a little montage over one speech. That's our end of the video present for you. Democrats, worst thing in the history of the world, Molly Hemingway stated. Punishable perhaps by death, I read you the headline, I read you the poll, is not voting to certify an election. However, now also Democrats who are conspiring right now to not certify the next election if our opponent wins. What does that mean? Why would she make such a bold claim? This from The Atlantic. The Democrats could disqualify Trump if the Supreme Court doesn't... Doesn't what? Give clear guidance on this Colorado case. House Democrats suggest they may not certify a Trump win on January 6th. You got to dig in deeper on that. That's a monster headline. Coming from the same folks that wrote why Americans might not trust the election results. The same folks that wrote bad losers. Election deniers are a threat to democracy. The midterms could be the last chance to stop them. The same publication that wrote worse than treason, no amount of rationalizing could change the fact that the majority of the Republican Party is advocating for the overthrow of an American election. Now putting out this article, how Democrats could disqualify Trump if the Supreme Court doesn't, doesn't what? Remember, by this point in the hearing, I read this to you earlier, the justices have made clear they didn't like the idea of allowing a single state to kick Trump out of the presidential race, and they didn't appear comfortable with the court doing so either. Sensing that Trump would likely, this is from the article, stay on the ballot, the attorney Jason Murray said that if the Supreme Court didn't resolve the questions of Trump's eligibility, it could come back with a vengeance. Words, if used by the opposing party, would have caused quite a stir. It would have been all over mainstream media, but this one goes silent. Nobody reports on it. Well, except for us here at Restricted Republic, of course. After the election, when Congress meets once again to count and certify the votes of the Electoral College. In interviews, senior House Democrats would not commit to certifying a Trump win, saying they would do so only if the Supreme Court affirms his eligibility. But during oral arguments, liberal and conservative justices alike seemed inclined to dodge the question of his eligibility altogether and throw the decision to Congress. And my friends, we would have a disaster if that was to happen. And wait till you hear who tells you we would have a disaster. All of this jaw-dropping to begin with, but it goes much deeper. That would be a colossal disaster. Representative Adam Schiff states of California. We already had one horrendous January 6th. We don't need another. If the court deems Trump eligible, even a few of his most fervent Democratic critics told me they would vote for certification should he win. Who is one of those critics? Eric Swalwell of California. I'm going to follow the law. I would not object out of protest of how the Supreme Court comes down. It would be doing what I didn't like about the January 6th Republicans. But then why wouldn't all Democrats stand on the same fence? They've been talking about this since January 6th. Ongoing. Incessantly. Nonstop. But now suddenly as we draw closer to the next election, these talking points are coming out. It makes no sense. If your jaw doesn't drop simply by reading this... What if the court declines to answer? I don't want to get into the chaos hypothetical, Adam Schiff told me. Nor did Representative Jim Clyburn of South Carolina, who served in the party leadership for two decades, I think he's an insurrectionist, he stated, of Trump. 
Minority leader Hakeem Jeffries, who would be speaker if Democrats retake the House, did not respond to questions sent to his office. The only response should have been not condoning a similar action to what you have been chastising and destroying for years on end. But that's not the response they got. The choice that Democrats would face if Trump won without a definitive ruling on his eligibility was almost too fraught for Representative Jamie Raskin of Maryland to contemplate. He told me he didn't know how he'd vote in that scenario. Jamie Raskin says, I don't know how I would vote in that scenario. Jamie, were you not on that committee of January 6th? I know you were. You should have a very clean cut answer to assure that that would never happen again. You deemed it unacceptable and announced it to the American public time and time and time and time again. But now, backtracking, keeping in mind, on top of everything I've told you, Trump has not been convicted of fomenting an insurrection, nor do any of his 91 indictments charge him with that particular crime. So the answer should be very easy. But in early 2021, every House Democrat, along with 10 Republicans, voted to impeach Trump for incitement of insurrection. And a significant majority of those lawmakers would still be in Congress next year. And what disaster could they now potentially cause if these rumors published in the Atlantic turn out to be true? But they had election reform justice. That should have fixed everything. No, not really. In late 2022, Congress did enact reforms to the Electoral College Act. That bill raised the threshold for objecting to a state's state slate of electors. And it clarified that the vice president in presiding over the opening of electoral college ballots had no real power to affect the outcome of the election, but it did not address the question of insurrection. In an amicus brief to the Supreme Court, a trio of legal scholars, Edward Foley, Benjamin Ginsburg, and Richard Hatson, warned the justices that if they did not rule on Trump's eligibility, it is a certain, it is a certainty the members of Congress would seek to disqualify him on January 6th of 2025. I asked Lofgren whether she would be one of those lawmakers. I might be. Wow. I was left speechless when I read this initially, as I hope you are now. How is that possible? Does that mean you didn't believe in what you've been saying all these years? Did every, all the trials that my taxpayer dollars went towards and everyone who's watching this broadcast tax dollars went to pay for didn't make a difference? You didn't mean what you said? The scholars also warned that serious political instability and violence could ensue. That possibility was on Raskin's mind, too. He conceded that the threat of violence could influence what Democrats do if Trump wins. He left himself it out. I voted to confirm out of fear. That's what he just stated. But Raskin added, it wouldn't necessarily stop them from trying to disqualify him. This is what's called facts and quotes and statements. We might just decide that's something we need to prepare for, Jamie Raskin. But you were on the committee and the panel. And now 91 cases to destroy a man's life all surrounding something that, according to these statements, means you didn't believe in at all? How Democrats could disqualify Trump if the Supreme Court doesn't such and what should have been? An article never written. They have been so resolute um, up until this point. But now it appears if the shoe was on the other foot, they're claiming they would do exactly what they've been complaining about, persecuting Trump over. This was an astounding article, astounding in its facts, out, astounding in its quotes, astounding in what it could mean. Come January 6th of 2025, I can't wait to see your comments below. I absolutely cannot wait. Please keep them clean. We always want them to stay up on the platform. The discourse is more important than something that someone would deem inappropriate. Always remember that. The discourse, the conversation is most important. 
And I want the conversation starting below. But reminder, now I promised you a gift at the end of this. This was a rather serious topic. So uh, we worked to edit together a speech from the White House that Biden just gave. About a two-minute speech. (laughs) With 32 cuts in a two-minute speech. So we delineated each one for you to show you. How is that possible? I speak for, what, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 minutes at times, and maybe I'll do two edits, maybe three. 32 in two minutes. That is, that is Biden for you now, isn't it? We love you all. Until next time, Godspeed and God bless Justice Knight. Signing out. An attack on one is an attack on all. That's what NATO's Article 5 says. It's a simple but powerful concept and embodies why one of America's greatest sources of strength is our alliances. They're not only important to us, they're important to the rest of the world. In the entire history of NATO, Article 5 has only been invoked once to stand with the United States of America after we were attacked on 9-11. The whole world knows if any adversary were to attack us, our NATO allies would have our back. And they know we would have their backs as well. And that's why what the former president said was so dangerous. He said he would encourage Russia to, and I quote, do whatever the hell they want, end of quote. A statement heard around the world does nothing but encourage bad behavior. After Putin's most fierce opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, died in a Russian prison last week, the former president, Trump, and other Republicans refused to hold Putin accountable for his death. Instead, Trump said Navalny's death made him realize how bad America is. He said, and I quote, we are a nation in decline, a failing nation, end of quote. Why does Trump always blame America? Putin is responsible for Navalny's death. Why can't Trump just say that? Putin's responsible. We have to stand up to Putin and pass the national bipartisan bill, the national security bill, supporting Ukraine as they defend themselves against Putin's vicious onslaught. The Senate's already acted. It's time for the House to act now because the votes are there. The Speaker needs to call a vote and abide by the will of the House. A clear majority supports what the Senate supports. So we can stand with Ukraine and send them the supplies they need to defend themselves. And prove to the world once more, America can be relied on. We stand strong with our allies. We have to remember who we are. We're the United States of America. We keep our commitments. We never walk away from our friends. And we sure as hell don't bow down to Vladimir Putin.